On this edition of Independent Sources, a generation of undocumented students waiting for an act of Congress. Republican politics, what the midterm elections could mean for U.S. policies in the Middle East. And an immigrant community that has kept a low profile, that is until now. Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. And I'm Viano Ravinka. The DREAM Act has been just that for almost a decade. Young people dreaming that Congress would act on legislation that could grant them legal status. But passage of the DREAM Act would only be possible if Senate Democrats backing the bill mustered support from moderate lawmakers from both parties. Hardline Republicans balked at the version of the legislation Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid introduced, while others used the GOP's success in the recent midterm elections as a mandate and vowed to tear down the country in search of undocumented immigrants. Still, thousands of students calling themselves the undocumented and unafraid see the DREAM Act as the best path to legalization for so many who were brought here illegally at an early age. I sat down with Javier Castaño of Queen's Latino newspaper and youth leader Daniela Alulema to talk about the DREAM Act and the push to pass the bill. Daniela, uh, tell me more about uh, what efforts your organization has made um, to uh, push this bill forward. Um, this year in particular, um, we've um, decided to take the ci civil disobedience actions. Um, in June, we held a hunger strike in front of Senator Schumer's office for 10 days. Um, earlier in the year, we walked from New York City to Washington, 250 miles over three weeks, uh, bringing the message to Washington that we cannot wait anymore. Uh, we have also done vigils, 24-hour vigils. We've um, staged pro protests in different um, places of the city. Um, and especially, we have been doing, um, working really hard to outreach and try to uh, reach out to those communities where there's this issue of undocumented immigration. And uh, we've asked them, we ask support from people to come on board and help us in this struggle. Javier, uh, activists have been uh, fighting to keep the DREAM Act bill separate from uh, the comprehensive immigration reform. Was it to give it a better chance at being passed or was it because there was not much hope for immigration reform to pass? I think that uh, nobody is expecting an immigration reform anytime soon, probably in the next two or three years. So they decide to open a window with the DREAM Act, which is very important. It's going to benefit more than two million uh, students across the the, the, this country uh, and it's a fight that it has to be done is something that is very important is going to help families but politicians are not paying attention to the, as, as you said uh, nine years and the Democratic Party hasn't done anything and uh, politicians don't endorse even Latino politicians some of them don't endorse the Dream Act and now they decide at the last minute to blame the Republican Party because they only have the control of the Congress for less than a month. So they decide, oh, we have done anything, so we have to blame somebody else. So a lot of manipulation there. The U.S. has a long precedent of uh, non-citizens uh, looking at the U.S. military as a path to citizenship. And uh, proponents of the DREAM Act now um, have been uh, saying that uh, these this pool of uh, students who would benefit from the uh, DREAM Act, if passed, would actually benefit the, the military. Uh, to quote uh, Bill Carr, formerly acting under Secretary of Defense for Military Personnel Policy, he said that the DREAM Act was very appealing to the military. Javier, does it bother you at all that um, um, these uh, young people are being advertised as uh, possible recruits to fight the country's war? No, it doesn't bother me um, because uh, what he's saying is true and uh, the DREAM Act is going to benefit this country in many ways. It's not going to cost anything to this country, so must pass. And if people have the opportunity to serve to this country or to go to college 
and at the same time uh, get the papers, that will be something very good for the country and for each family. So it doesn't bother me. Daniela, you agree? Our mm -hmm. message is um, let us serve. Different people have different ways in which they want to serve this country. All of us feel Americans. We're just missing one piece of paper. So some of us want to go to college and get a degree and serve as nurses, doctors, lawyers. Other, um, other people want to serve in the military. So I think it's up to the individual. And in either case, uh, at the end of the day, what we want to do is contribute back to the community that um, has given us so much. Is this uh, mostly a, a Latino campaign? I think a large population of the undocumented uh, community is Latino. However, we have uh, people from different countries, uh, different ethnicities being part of the DREAM Act campaign. Um, people from um, Asian countries, African countries are coming forward and, and supporting. So um, I don't think it's mainly a Latino campaign. It's actually, it affects uh, people from all over the world. So we have people in the leadership from different backgrounds. Some Latino Congress members are not supporting the, the DREAM Act. How many exactly, Daniela, and why not? At this point, we have the support of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. Um, it came a little bit late in the um, struggle, in the fight for the DREAM Act. Um, unfortunately, for quite some time, they were focused on passing um, or getting a chance for comprehensive immigration reform. Um, but finally, they, they are with us. Um, a few members of their caucus is not, um, have not co-sponsored the DREAM Act yet, but our hope is that they will come on board eventually. Yeah, mm -hmm. two weeks ago I was in a, a, a meeting in San Brigida uh, Church in Brooklyn, and it was uh, Nidia Velasquez, Congresswoman, and she was talking about how important it is uh, the dream out for the Latino families and uh, students, but uh, she hasn't endorsed the dream out ever. So there's a lot of lies here. And is there uh, another path to citizenship uh, for these young people other than the dream act? Uh, the other alternative is the immigration reform, and nobody's talking about that. So, um, unfortunately, if the dream act passes, we'll continue um, to be feeling Americans, but not uh, using all the power and all the, will, the, the work that we want to invest in this country. So our only chance is passing this legislation. Otherwise, we'll be back in the shadows. So. Javier Castaño, Daniela Alulema, thank you both for being here today. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. Still to come on independent sources, the Middle East reacts to midterm election results. Before that, Marlene Peralta with some other news. Thanks, Vianora. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic media. El Diario La Prensa reports that the New York City building violation law, known as the Alternative Enforcement Program, may be expanded. City Council Speaker Christine Quinn announced last week that she wants the law to include asthma triggers, such as mold and pest infestations, as building violations. The expansion would also bring larger buildings into the inspection system. The current law calls for 200 buildings with the worst housing violations to force its landlords to make necessary repairs. New America Media profile an American doctor who has been documenting India's AIDS orphans through a photography project called Forgotten Faces of AIDS since 2005. Dr. Donna Gwentner, who is an epidemiologist and a photojournalist, says she wants to increase awareness before India loses an entire generation to this disease. She predicts that within five years, 40% of these orphans will be infected with HIV if nothing is done to prevent it. India has the largest number of AIDS orphans in the world, with 1.2 million children. The newly appointed director of the Schomburg Center for Research admitted to the Amsterdam News he is an unusual candidate for the position, but said he has what it takes to do the job. The comments were made after critics complained that Dr. Khalil Gibran Muhammad lacks experience and is too young for the position. The 38-year-old Chicago native has an accounting background and holds a master's degree in business. He told the Harlem paper he's already making plans to strengthen the center's legacy. He's scheduled to assume the new position next summer. And finally, the efforts to save forgotten Jewish cemeteries in Eastern Europe have grown stronger thanks to the help of college students. 
According to the Forward, Albany dentist Michael Lozman started the initiative in 2002, bringing Dartmouth students to Belarus to restore the deteriorated cemetery where his grandfather was buried. And since a wave of American youth have followed to join the cause. 17 of the 90 abandoned cemeteries in that country have already been restored thanks also to the help of the locals. Polish Jews have also expressed interest in saving the more than 1,000 Jewish cemeteries in their country. Those are just a few headlines from the ethnic media. Back to Gary and Vianora in the studio. Thanks, Marlene. According to polls, international issues played almost no role in the November midterm elections, at least not for voters. But for people in many parts of the world, the impact the election would have on U.S. foreign policy was foremost. This was especially true in the Middle East and Arab world. Would Republicans who now control the House be more hawkish? What would be the effect on policies about the Palestinians and on a relationship with Iran? I talked with three Middle East experts about the prospects for the diplomatic strategies developed by the Obama administration now that the Republicans control the House of Representatives. Uh, I'd like to start with an article published by Al Jazeera English recently. Uh, they said everyone in this part of the world, meaning the Middle East, is already wondering if uh, all these political changes will not make the Obama administration more hawkish with regard to its policy to Pakistan and Afghanistan. Khaled, um, from what you're seeing in the Middle Eastern media, is that a fair assessment of the reactions in the Middle East? Generally speaking, I think people are relatively uh, cautious, you know, about the new uh, structure of their Congress in the United States, and they feel that the victory of the uh, uh, Republican Party, especially uh, some who have uh, sort of right-wing views, uh, will make uh, the job of the present Obama administration more difficult uh, when it comes to foreign policy, foreign policy initiatives, whether in relation to Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, or in our case in the Middle East, in the case of Palestine, Israel. I mean, already the, Mr. Obama gave a lot of promises concerning settlements which he was not able to fulfill. And now with the issue of a Republican Congress, I think even uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, Mr. Netanyahu, expects to get uh, you know, easier uh, treatment from Washington as compared uh, to the previous Congress. Morteza, how has uh, the news of the Republicans uh, winning the U.S. Congress been received in Iran? Uh, I think that some expert, um, political experts, believe that um, uh, the situation going to worse in Middle East between the United States and the um, Middle East, especially Iran. Because the, if it divided the power between the president and Congress, the Congress is more powerful than, Congress, uh, than the president. But now the uh, Congress uh, um, power is divided to House and Senate. But the public can dominate in the uh, House. Having to regard the, the lobbyists in the Congress, I think they follow up their aim in Middle East and they don't want some, um, solve some problem in Middle East. But I think they push to government and they don't want to solve the issue between the United States and Middle East and the situation going to worse, especially the APAC lobby. APAC lobby don't like um, the relationship between the Obama and Middle East is going to better. But they don't want, and I think um, having to regard they are influence in the uh, Republican and also the Republican now uh, dominate in the uh, House, the situation for Middle East is going worse, is not oh, being better. But can you talk specifically about Iran? What is Iran uh, expecting of, of uh, the new Congress now? Um, um, I Iran is a part of the Middle East in this discussion. But I think that during the um, Obama administration, Republican to push him for uh, separate him from his policy toward Iran, the good policy toward Iran. But now they dominate in the um, um, House, they push more to Obama and destroy everything. They don't want the good behavior uh, the, uh, from Obama toward uh, Iran. But I think the situation going towards during the two years, next two years, two years, uh, but uh, until the uh, next presidential election, uh, nothing uh, um, more um, change in United States policy yes. toward Iran. Especially that the United States lives in a constant election, so 
I mean, already we've just done with the Congress elections and people are preparing for the next presidential elections. And the feel is that with this new structure of Congress, that this result actually might affect the upcoming presidential elections. So many people, although we still have a relatively long time, but um, some experts in the Middle East are afraid we're entering into this uh, lame duck president area, although we still, we'll still have two more years to go. Um, I want to bring in uh, Maya and uh, um, ask her to talk about uh, specific uh, policies that we can expect. Uh, Foreign Policy magazine says uh, a GOP-controlled Congress will have uh, a significant impact on Middle Eastern uh, policy as it might overwhelmingly approve uh, an Iran sanctions bill or even fail to confirm ambassadors to Turkey or Syria. Uh, Maya, in your view, how likely are uh, prospects such as these? Well, I think any time you have a, a shift in party leadership, the general consensus is to focus on this is switched from Democratic control of the House to the Republican control of the House. Uh, in reality, in some cases, that's not the major shift. We're dealing with a situation where there are particular individuals that are going to become chairman of these committees. And they have a Democrat in the White House, which means that their views on these things, separate from just the fact that their views are relevant, they will uh, inherently play a bit of an obstructionist role to prevent the Democratic president from moving forward. This is the standard executive branch versus legislative branch conflict on this. You take that and you add to it the fact that you do have individual members with very different views with regards to Middle East policy, which is an area we're most concerned with. And, and you do potentially have a formula for a, a real major shift uh, with regards to, to the region. Uh, that's particularly problematic for our community because here we are looking at President Obama and where he currently is two years since his election at a time when folks are very excited about what he could potentially do in office. So there's an evaluation of that. And now we have new players coming in to control uh, the House of Representatives. And these are players with a track record on these issues. And they're one that, that concern us. Khaled, well, we keep talking about what the American government is going to do vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East, but it's ultimately the American people who elected uh, this government and this Congress. Um, could it be that, uh, could uh, the people in the Middle East uh, uh, think this way mostly, and uh, could uh, this new setup uh, further inflate anti-American sentiment? Well, like, you know, I, I think that the vision, or most people look, the experience the Middle East has with the Congress has not been a very positive one. Generally speaking, we're known that people like, uh, you know, in the Congress, for example, uh, tend to be more biased towards Israel. Sometimes in the Arab world, we say that the U.S. Congress here, when it comes to the Middle East policies, is, is more pro-Israel than the Israeli Knesset itself. So, I mean, uh, uh, I don't think, like, we should expect a radical shift in attitude towards uh, how people in the Arab region see the United States just because of the elections. But I want to note that I guess that maybe not just the Middle East, we've seen it uh, recently with this uh, agreement with Russia on START, for example, even because, because of this changing uh, Congress, now uh, President Obama is worried himself that uh, the new Congress will not approve uh, the START treaty with Russia for the w reduction of weapons of uh, mass destruction and nuclear weapons. So that's also uh, another worry, even we work both at the United Nations concerning climate change. Yeah, I mean, of course, again, uh, the, the Republicans, or some of the Republicans at least, have more conservative uh, positions towards climate change uh, compared to the Democrats who tend to be more liberal towards this issue. So I want to say that the, the, the impression in general uh, has not been very positive, not just about the Middle East and expectations from this Congress, but concerning many world issues, particularly that now we have uh, some of these Tea Party candidates who tend to even be more on the right of, the, uh, of uh, some of the Republican and the Republican positions that we've got to know over the past few years. Corteza, you mentioned before uh, the good behavior of uh, President Obama. Can you talk more about uh, how Obama is currently viewed uh, by Iran and uh, how much uh, does it get played uh, in the news, the fact that uh, he declared uh, to be a president who's going to push for more diplomatic uh, um, relations with Iran? Yeah. That the first step up by uh, Obama uh, have a good sign toward Iran, but unfortunately, it uh, he doesn't uh, he didn't uh, follow up with practical measurement. That's what's very important. Only in a slogan, only in rhetoric, but not practical behavior toward Iran. Unfortunately, during the 30 years go uh, till now. The, uh, there is a Republican is coming in power, uh, um, Democrat coming in power many times, several times. But unfortunately, 
the mistrust between Iran and the United States is too high. They should, both sides, they, they should solve this problem. Many times, Iran asked the United States for relationship, good relationship, and uh, uh, to reduce the um, enemy behavior toward Iran. But unfortunately, the United States didn't obey that. And some part of that uh, relationship between Iran and the United States continue during these 30 years. But I think if they want to have a good relationship with Iran, they should to consider Iran's role in the Middle East, and also their behavior should be changed toward Iran in the Middle East. Maya, how will your organization, who was established uh, uh, to um, uh, improve the relations between uh, the U.S. Uh, and the Middle East, how will it um, adjust uh, um, to, with, with this new structure of the Congress? Well, actually, the organization is devoted to the political empowerment of Arab Americans, um, and and frankly, we are a nonpartisan organization. And that is, our chairman of the board happens to be Republican, our president is a Democrat, and we'll remain very engaged with with both uh, parties of leadership. Um, our particular concern is is that um, individual members may have positions on on that they've articulated already. For example, our incoming majority leader, a congressman from Virginia named Aaron Cantor, has said some things during his career in Congress that are very problematic with regards to Middle East peace, with regards to his positions on the Palestine-Israel conflict. And in fact, even after the midterm elections concluded, and recently Prime Minister Netanyahu was in the United States for a visit, in a meeting after the Prime Minister, he released some statements his office did suggesting loosely, basically, I have your back here in terms of working with this president. Those are the kinds of things that our community, both Republicans and Democrats, uh, Democrats obviously in a partisan way, but Republicans to sort of work with the leadership of their own parties, really feel strongly about making sure that their views are represented. And ultimately, because our policies need to be better in the region, that is what our focus is and it will continue to be uh, as we move forward. Khaled, let's talk about uh, Israel uh, as, as a final point. Um, how, what do you expect uh, the policies uh, towards Israel to be? Well, I guess, as, uh, as Maya just referred, I mean, uh, the, the, Netanyahu, during his last visit here, uh, he was actually acting uh, more a stubborn way since he first came to office. I mean, concerning the issue of settlements, uh, it's been made a very, very generous offer, I guess, by the uh, Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, just to freeze uh, the settlements in the West Bank and Gaza uh, for 10 months, uh, or another period, oh, sorry, for three months only, actually, although the settlements themselves are illegal, they're not supposed to be there. But to stop something illegal, you still get rewarded, and still Mr. Netanyahu is not very happy. And in, he basically believes that uh, what at least some observers saw as a kind of a different position from the Obama administration concerning the Palestinian issue, he now maybe he feels, co Mr. Netanyahu feels more confident they can use the new Congress structure to put pressure on President Obama uh, to be, uh, for example, uh, put the pressure instead on the Palestinians who really uh, have nothing much to give because they are the occupied parts. But uh, generally speaking, people expect the Middle East peace process to be stalled. Mr. Obama came, first of all, with very high expectations, and maybe also that's part of the problem. When Mr. Obama came in, people had very, very high expectations. The realities sort of constrained him. And right now, with the Congress, uh, with its present structure, I'm afraid we are going to see uh, probably more uh, biased uh, policies uh, towards Israel from here in the United States. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Morte Zagorogi, Hale Dawood, and Maya Berry. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you so much. When we come back, we learn about a group of Central Americans with African and indigenous roots. So stay tuned. Finally from us, part two of our series, Tribes of New York. On this episode, we encounter one particular community whose members say they are a hidden culture. The Garifuna are mixed race people from Central America. For centuries, different colonial powers have punished them for practicing their culture. It's a history of oppression that has left its mark even on the psyche of immigrant Garifuna groups living in the U.S. 
Community leaders are now pushing initiatives that empower the Garifuna people to claim and embrace their identity. There's a lot of people that don't know who we are. You know, like the fact that I'm from Honduras, I speak Spanish, they think I'm just straight up Spanish. And, you know, I would like to let them know that we are descendants from St. Vincent, and it goes a little further than that. Sometimes I call this the hidden culture. Not too many people know about Garifuna people. Why? Because we easily blend in with the African American. They look at us on the street, they just think, hey, we, they're just African Americans. So there's, but deep behind us, there's a you know, rich culture that a lot of people don't know anything about. With a rich culture that originates from the Caribbean island of St. Vincent, the Garifuna people, or the Garinagu, are descendants of the indigenous Carib and Arawak and West African slaves shipwrecked near St. Vincent. Today, they live primarily in Central America and maintained their own language, one that is derived from Arawakan and Carib. I speak the language 110%. Felix Gamboa was born and raised in a Honduran Garifuna village. A few years ago in New York, he started his own Garifuna dance company. I just welcome everybody. Sometimes they tell me, I don't know how to dance, I don't know how to speak the language. I say, I don't care, you'll learn it here. There are 200,000 Garifunas in New York City, mostly in Brooklyn, Manhattan, and the, in the Bronx. And the Bronx is where the largest ma uh, majority is, and we uh, actually say that there are 100,000 here in the Bronx. It's a community that can compete in size with most major immigrant groups in the city. Though Garifuna people have been in New York roughly since the 1930s, Avila believes the community may be the least known cultural group in the area. We actually had um, identify ourselves with the different nationalities. As you know, the Garifunas actually hail from Guatemala, Belize, Nicaragua, and Honduras. So what we decided to do was to do away, at least from the perception that we were from those countries and started presenting ourselves as Garifunas. One of the ways to come forward as Garifuna was by claiming the identity on the 2010 census forms. You're indicating that your race is other and writing in the word Garifuna. The Garifuna Coalition has spread the word by working with blogger Teofilo Colon Jr. and others. Colon Jr. recently launched BeingGarifuna.com out of what he perceived to be the need for a blog to serve the community. I just said, look, I got I to gotta start something up, start some sort of blog and, and, or some sort of entity that can, among other things, get the word out about different events that are happening in the community. The blog is composed of news that I come across or just things, anything related to the subject of Garifuna people, academic papers people writing up stuff on different blogs. There's some people that just write of their experiences being in some of these countries and villages in Central America. And I'll say, hey, look what I found. 17-year-old Arnold Martinez never lived in a Garifuna village, but experiences his culture through the traditional dances he makes time to practice every Thursday night. I love my culture so, so much, and I like, I like my people, and I love, my, I love the dance, I love the food, I love everything, I love my culture so, so much, so I make, it a, I make it a mandatory thing to come here every Thursday so I can practice and be a part of the group. For Independent Sources, I'm Viano Ravinka. That's our show. Thanks for staying tuned. We hope you'll join us again next week. Till then, stay independent-minded.